is that we have fallen short from a mark. From, the, from the, the bullseye. We don't even get close to the bullseye. We don't even get close to the circles around the bullseye. We probably hit the ground as, as it's coming out of the out of the boat. I, I, I just made me think about um, uh, I got uh, Isabel a bow and arrow for her birthday. Or my wife and I got Isabel a bow and arrow for her birthday. And I got out there and I thought, well, you know, that's pretty easy, right? I'll get up there and I, I grabbed it. I watched her shoot it several times. And I get up there and I pull that bow back and I aim it. And I thought, oh, this is, yeah, okay. And then I, all of a sudden I, I go to let go of the string and that bow just dropped right in front of me. Like I, I like it didn't even shoot, it just dropped right at my feet. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Pick the bow up, I mean, the, the arrow up again. And, and I, I, I stick it to the string again, and I pull that thing back, and I go to aim it, and sure enough, second time, falls to my feet. And I think, what am I doing wrong? But this is the way it is. This is the way it is. My, my daughter had to tell me how to shoot a bow and arrow. <laughs> Her strapping father, she had to teach me how to shoot a bow and arrow. <laughs> so uh, I still didn't do any, any better. I mean, after she taught me, and I, I, I'm not that good at shooting a bow and arrow. Of course, I can't see that far. So uh, <laughs> I, I guess I, I look at the, the audience now and I think, wow, oh, there's like thousands of people here. Well, because I can't see. No, I'm kidding. So, anyways, <laughs> I digress. So it's that, that arrow that shoots and lands at your feet. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who we are as sinners. We fall short of God's glory all the time. Our best works, our best righteousness, anything that we can muster up as good is considered filthy rags to our God. I mean, think about that. That's who you are before God. A filthy rat. There is no good in anyone. I'm not telling you this. The Bible tells you this. Go read it in Romans. There is none righteous. There is none holy. There is none that seeks after God. So God has a purpose, and he has a plan, and he uses us, broken people, to fulfill his plan. Is that not amazing to you? That he can actually do all of this, and, and even prophesy it in the future. Uh, yeah, this is what's happening, this is what's going to happen, and and my word is truth, my word is eternal, and the oath that I make with you will be eternal, and everything that I tell you will come to pass. And I'm going to do it through all of you broken people. Why? Why does he do that? So that we may glorify him. So that we, we, we proclaim how great he is. Look, the Old Testament, if you look at all of the people that he's talking about here, they're broken people. You, you see where they're afraid? That if you go to the Old Testament and read their stories, they're afraid. They're frightened people who do things on their own and mess up all the time. But God's plan is steady. God's plan is true. And it will, he is sovereign over all things and it will come to pass. When he said to Abraham that there, his people were going to be in a country 
that was going to hold them as slaves, but he was going to deal with that country, and he was going to bring Abraham's descendants out of that country, but he was going to judge that country. And that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. You think about it. Abraham was not even looking for God. You were not looking for God. I was not looking for God. God came to me. God came to you. God came to Abraham and said to Abraham, get up and go. Now, in doing so, he, he had to have some type of faith. Am I going to trust this vision that I just heard and saw? Am I going to trust this? Am I crazy? Get up and leave all of my family and, and all of my inheritance and everything that, 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 that I know and just leave? That, that wasn't something that he mustered up. Because you see, God was going to work through Abraham. Abraham could not thwart or misdirect or change God's plan. You are not going to change God's plan. No matter what you do or how you try, you're not going to change his plans. So what does he do? To use broken vessels. What does he do to use us? Well, he comes and he gives us life. And he gives us faith. And he gives us this gift. And he redeems us. He buys us. He purchases us. He purchased us. Through his son's precious blood. He shows us his love by giving his love to us. See, God was well pleased with his son. And, and here's the thing, and I told this Wednesday, God's love for the world is the same love that he has for his son. Why? How do I know this? Because he gave us his son. His treasure. You see, God's love is up here and down here. He loves you a little bit more than he loves this person here. It's not like that. It is a constant, eternal love. If God's love was like that, if it changed all the time, then, it, then we couldn't worship him because he would not be a God. If he changes... But God says, I don't change. I don't change. So here, he uses broken people to fulfill his purpose. He has to give us faith. Every single one of these people here, they had to live by faith. And we see throughout their stories that they didn't have much faith. They didn't have much faith. They laughed when God said, I'm going to give you a son. I'm an old man. How am I going to have a son? How is my wife going to have a son? She's old. I mean, you think about it. Everyone that he's talking about here, 
They were scared. That's not trusting God. They, they were afraid that people were going to kill them. Abraham, Isaac, did the same thing that his father did. Right? Why? This is not my wife. This is my sister. Isaac, it says that it's kind of funny because it says that uh, uh, the king of Imelech saw Isaac sporting with his sister. And he's like, hmm, this ain't right. I like the way the King James puts it, sporting. So I, Isaac was caressing his wife, is what the, the Bible says. And Abimelech says, whoa, wait a minute. Well, sisters and brothers don't do this kind of thing. This is not your sister. This is your wife. Why have you done this? Well, I was afraid that you were going to kill me. Abraham did the same thing. You think there's faith there? You think God, uh, he, he's not saying, oh, God, you're in control. No. Isaac, Jacob, all of those, they, they thought that if they, they took control of the situation, that, that they could handle the situation and, and help God out. Let me help God out. Hey, uh, Abraham, I, I need you to, uh, uh, this is Sarah talking to his, her, her husband Abraham. Uh, we, we need a child. Yes, God had promised a child. Well, that child can come through Hagar, my servant. But that's not what God promised. You see, it's, it's all about what God wants. It's all about what he wants. Now, having said all that, and that is my point of phrase, I think. Having said all that, let us go into our passage. Because we saw in, earlier, last week, that uh, Moses, Moses even, who was afraid of Pharaoh and uh, ran off into the uh, wilderness because he had killed uh, a, 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 an Egyptian. And he runs off into the wilderness because he's afraid that Pharaoh was going to kill him. And so he's there in the wilderness for 40 years. He's about 80 years old. And God shows up in a burning bush. That's not burning, but it's on fire. And something happens to Moses at that moment. Moses has faith, a little stronger faith. When you see that it, it started a little bit, a little bit earlier because he decided that he was going to align himself up with the uh, deplorables, with the slaves. Because he was a Hebrew, he was going to align himself up with the Hebrews. He was able to enjoy all the things of the Egyptians, uh, the pleasures, the passing pleasures. He was, a, he was able to enjoy all that, but he gave that up to align himself up with a people of promise. A people that were, that were promised an inheritance. Now he didn't see that inheritance, but it was something that he had faith in. It may not have been a strong faith in God, but we see that God perfects our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. And so what we see here is that he passed through the Red Sea, the uh, Israelites passed through a Red Sea. You think that is going to strengthen somebody's faith? It strengthened mine, I think. And I walked and saw walls of water on either side and then turn around and watch the, the Egyptian army be swallowed up by that water. Do you think for one minute that you wouldn't have faith? But what do we see the Israelites doing once they get to the other side? What do they do? They build a calf, a golden calf, and start worshiping the calf and saying, this is our God. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? But they pass through the Red Sea, and it says here in verse 30 of, of, of chapter 11 of Hebrews, it says, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled.
his circle for seven days. Now, it says here that it, does, it doesn't say a line up a person with this. I mean, did you see that? It's not by faith Joshua. I mean, because that's what we would expect, right? You see, by faith Moses, by faith. But it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. You see, now we're looking at a whole group of people that are trusting in God. Why is that? Well, for one, they've been walking in the wilderness for 40 years. Their shoes have remained uh, they have soul on their shoes. Uh, their clothes are not wearing out. They've been fed all these years. They've been taking care of the water. They've watched their, their fathers and their mothers and their grandparents fall in the desert dead because of their unbelief. I mean, so, so they've seen this happen and all of a sudden they come up to this to the Jordan, and they're getting ready to cross over, getting ready to cross over into the Jordan, into the land of Canaan. And their first enemy, the first people that they're going to come in contact with is Jericho. All right, so let's look at that real quick, because some of you may not be familiar with that story. So let's turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went in or out. The Lord came to Joshua. See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war encircling the city once. You shall do it for six days. Okay? See, God has a plan. Okay? And he's going to use fallen people to do this. And not just fallen people. He's going to do it without... He's going to knock down those walls without even casting one stone. Not even casting one spear. See, this is God's plan. But you have to get a people to do this, right? So he's given them the faith. And now he's growing the faith. He's the perfecter of the faith. And all of a sudden, what happens is you start to see people work. You see faith, and you see work. But work doesn't come before the faith. Faith is first. Then comes your works. So what happens here? He says, also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpet. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Now imagine hearing this war plan. Seriously. So we're going to quietly walk around the walls. All of us, all of the children of Israel are going to walk around this wall quietly without making a sound for six days, seven days. And on the seventh day, we're going to do this seven times. And then you're going to blow a long trumpet and we're going to scream and the walls are going to come down. Try telling that to uh, our government when it comes to Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever war we fought. You think the men are going to go, what, are you nuts? We're not going to shoot a 
One shot. You see, this is God working. This is God working. This is not us working. This is God moving. This is not them working. This is God working. And see, what happens here, he says, So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Then he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets. And the Ark of the Covenant uh, of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark. And while they had continued to blow the trumpets, the, the Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I tell you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the, uh, the, ark of the Lord taken around the city. Circling it once. Then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Imagine what the Jericho people were, were seeing and going, what is going on? So they make their circle and they go into the camp for the night and they sleep. Seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets. The armed men went before them and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. Thus the second day, and they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this, they did so for six days. Then on the seventh day, they rose early in the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. It was already given. It was already done. It was the work of the Lord. Then the city shall be under the van. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live. But she hid the, uh, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the van, so that you do not covet them <clears throat> and take some of the things under the van and make the camp of Israel a curse and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They're set apart to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great joy. And the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey, and it, with the edge of the sword. Joshua said to the men, to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there, as you have been sworn to her. So the young men went. Uh, when young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had that also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. And we'll get to talk about that here in a short. But, but what's happening here is that God is moving. God is pre preparing his people. They, he is perfecting their faith. He is, he is growing their faith. Imagine seeing those walls come down. After everything that God has said will happen. And then they shout, the walls fall down. And you think to yourself, well, why do they have to kill the men and women, young and old? Babies, donkeys, everything? Yes, everything. These people were...
were a horrible people. Don't sit there and think to yourself, oh, look, those poor Jericho people. They, they were a horrible people. They were immoral beyond belief. You think what's going on here is, is, is horrible, you know, as far as what's, what's happening in our country, but I'm telling you, it was way far worse. The Canaanite people were a horrible bunch of people. So they go in there and they destroy the land. But it says here in Hebrews, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were, what? Disobedient. Disobedient. You're like, the Jericho people? Disobedient? She didn't align herself up with the, with the Jericho people? She obeyed God's voice? How? How did she obey God's voice? Well, let's turn. Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, then the sons, uh, the, the Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, where they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them and said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that men went out, that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the, to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, this is the spies, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, now listen, I know, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. See, she knows, she knows the promise of God. She knows that God has given them the land. It's no secret. It was no secret. Everyone knew the promises of Abraham. They, back in the day, they, they knew Abraham. And you think Abraham kept a secret? See, all the people here knew that throughout history that the stories have been told throughout history. They sit around fires, they sit around tables, and they tell the history. That's one of the things that we, we don't do here in this, in this world right now. We don't talk about our history. We don't talk about how we got where we are. Through the good times and the bad. We don't sit around and tell our children. This is how we came to be. How often do you sit around the table and talk about God? Talk about what he's done. With your children, with your family. See, these are things that we've been commanded to do as well. It's a generational thing. You want to know why our children aren't the, the way they are right now? Or the, why, why they are the way they are right now? It's our apathy. Our refusal to sit around the table and 
talk to them in a loving, gracious, kind way about our Lord and God. So she knew. She knew. She even heard the rumors of what was what was going on in Egypt. But we heard. We heard what your God did. We we heard, all of us heard about you passing through the Red Sea. We heard about all that. And he says, she says here, look, verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Faith. Faith. She takes what she's here heard, right? She takes what she's heard and she trusts it. She trusts it. And she says, your God, the one you serve, I want him. He is the God above and the God below. He's the one. That's who I want to attach myself to. Here's the thing. What do people hear from you? When people talk about you, is it, that is a godly man. That man loves God. That woman loves God. I want that. I've seen what God does in their life. I've seen how they've gone through trial and tribulation and persevered to the end and had joy. I've seen how they love people. People, it's our witness. This is our witness. And, and people, they, either they're going to love your God or they're going to blaspheme your God. Christian. Call themselves Christian. Those people don't love anybody. Or do they hear great things? Those people will be loved. I, I want to be a part of that. See, it, it's what she heard. She didn't see these things. She heard these things. And she trusted. Why? Well, because they showed up at her front door. These people showed up at her front, at her front door. The people of promise are now circling her land, the walls. See, see she, she's getting, she's understanding, and she understands that her faith is growing stronger and stronger and stronger throughout what she has heard and what she sees and what God is doing. Her faith is growing. And you see here, it says, Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you. This is a mercy. This is chesed. It's a, it's a uh, what, what we call um, uh, the, the mercy. Will you, will you show mercy to, to someone? And, and um, God does this. And when it says that he shows kindness, just think of the word chesed. Use the spit. This is mercy. This is love. This is a loving kindness that he pours out upon you. 
You don't deserve it, but he pours out upon you. It's, she, she's saying, please make me righteous, in other words. So that's what we do. We're, we go to God and we say, Lord, uh, show me your mercy. And in doing so, what he does in showing mercy to you, you no longer deserve your punishment, which you really do deserve your punishment. But because Christ has died for you, he justifies you in his mercy. He pours out his mercy on you, his kindness, and does not hold you guilty. Because he's put all that guilt on his son. See, somebody has to pay the price. It's either you or Jesus Christ. Well, that kind of works. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household, and give me a pledge of truth, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. She knew what was coming. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land, that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. See, here they are reflecting God. You see, uh, what I've been talking about on Wednesdays is that, that God's name is, is faithful, it's loving, it's compassionate, it's kind, it's slow to anger. These are the things that God is proclaiming as he's going before Moses. These are the things that he's proclaiming his name to be. This is who he is. These are his attributes. This is his characteristic. This is his substance. And now you see these spies dealing with Rahab like God would deal with it. They're reflecting. They're reflecting God. So the men said to her, our, our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land, that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. She said to them, go to the hill country, so that the pursuers will not happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterwards you may go on your way. The men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless uh, when we come into the land you tie this cord of scarlet thread in your window, through which you let us down. And gather to yourself into the house your father, your mother, your brother, and all your father's household. Does this sound familiar? This should sound familiar to you. Are we talking about a Passover? You see, it was a red scarlet. Now, don't get too caught up in the red scarlet thing, as far as the, the, the string that was hanging from the window. But what it was, was a, it was a passing over of judgment. Because she was under this red scarlet, judgment did not come to her household. Same as it was in Passover. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured over the, the lintels and the doorposts. Because of the, of, of the blood of the, of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. The, the paschal lamb, the, the lamb that was slain. Everybody in the household was saved. If you had that covering. See, I, I'm telling you, the propitiation, the covering, is all throughout the Bible. When God's judgment comes, it, it, there's a covering that needs to take place. And see, we have that covering in Jesus Christ. We're hidden in Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly says that we are in Him. Because we are in Him, we no longer receive the judgment. The judgment will not come to us. Because we are covered by His blood. And so we have a, a 
judgment that's coming to the city, and you have a people, a household, that is saved out of this city, a remnant saved. This is amazing. It's an amazing story. But, but uh, the one thing that I want you to take away, other than the fact that the walls crumbled, but she lived in the wall. That's so I'm sure there's a part of the wall that didn't crumble, that stayed like a column in all of that destruction. And they went and got her and her household, and they brought her out and set her outside the camp. Now, here's the thing, and this is the beauty of it. And I, I want you to get this, and, and I want you to see this, that God had a plan for Rahab. God had a plan for Rahab. Turn real quick, Matthew, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 5. I want you to see this. You think you're going to thwart God's plan? You think you're going to change God's plan? You think you can change God's plan? Listen to this. This is amazing. Solomon was the father of Boaz. Does Boaz sound familiar to you? We're talking about Ruth. Ruth and Boaz. Um, you know who Boaz's mother was? Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot. And Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of who? David. David. You see the line of, of David, the line of Jesus Christ, came through a Gentile woman named Rahab, who just happened to be a harlot. I get chills thinking about that. You see, it, God working the faith in Rahab because he was going to use Rahab to have children. And, and that those children were going to become great kings and the Messiah of all the earth. I'm telling you, it blows me away. You see, even Ruth, even Ruth, she wasn't an Israelite. She was a Gentile. But this is the line. This is the promise of God. This is the, the, the oath that God has given. This is everything that God has told them that will come to pass. And he does it through broken people. And those broken people have to have life in order for him to work through. So he gives them life. And they have to have faith in him. And so what does he do? He gives them faith as well. And then he shows them over and over and over and over again how he comes through, how he pulls through. He shows up every single time. And then we'll see that he is the author. That he is the perfecter. That the word means to finish. To mature. So when you hear that, when you see that word perfect, perfected, or anything like that, think of finished, mature. And so he is the maturer of your faith. He started it. He's going to finish it. Right. Now, that is the proof. Again, I want to take you back to verse 1. That is the proof that you are a child of God. 
That's the proof. That's the assurance. The title deed. You've got it. How do I know I got it? How do I know I'm a child of God? Because I have faith. I trust in Him. And you know the beauty of faith? What faith brings? Works. Every single one of these people had faith, and there was works involved. There was obedience that was involved. Remember what we said here, that Rahab was not part of the disobedient ones, the ones who, who heard, the people of Jericho who heard, and yet they did not fall on their faces and ask for mercy. They rebelled against God and said, we will fight him. Just telling you, this is, this is an amazing story. Go back and read it. Study it. Understand it. Because this is how we, this is how we live. This is our faith. And this is our works. There should be works. If you truly believe, there should be works. Father in heaven, I pray that you will open our hearts to your word. Lord, we, we need you in all things. The very breath that we take is because you have allowed it to happen. You have given our breath. You have appointed us a time to live and a time to die. You are in control of all things. Father, we are dust. We're dirt that you have breathed life into. What do we do as dirt and dust? What can we give you as dirt and dust? But ourselves. And the only way we can do that is through your loving grace and mercy. So I ask, Father, that you pour out your grace and your mercy upon those who are listening to this word today. Open their eyes and their ears and their hearts. Let it sink deep down inside. Let them understand that it is by your faith that you have given us. And that you help us to grow in that faith through persecution, through trials, through tribulations. You do all of that. So that we build character and we're stronger and persevere in the end. Father, help us to look to you for all things. Even when we, we feel like we're at our rope's end, Lord, you, you're there. So, Father, please, I'm begging, save. Bring people together. Show love uh, to one another. This is, this is my desire. Because it's your desire. I don't desire anything that you don't want, Father. And I, I want people to know you. And I want them to experience your joy and your love that you have for, for one another. Father and Son and Spirit. That we may be one. And then we get to enjoy that as well. Father, I, I, I just ask that you strengthen those who are believers in, in their faith so that they no longer fear, but they hold fast to you. And I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, St. Branch, I, I'm happy. I'm, I'm so happy that you're came today, I pray that, uh, that God will, will shine his face upon you, that he will turn his countenance towards you, that he will be gracious to you, he will bless you, and I pray, my prayer for you is that you go out into this world and proclaim the greatness that he is, and what he's done for you. Show your works so that others may glorify him. Wednesday night service, don't forget. Thank you, sir. I appreciate my scheduler.
uh, Wednesday night service at 6.55, 7 o'clock, and uh, we are studying John. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for, for loving us and for taking care of us. And uh, I, I pray that, again, that God will bless you. So, uh,